First off, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be here with you this morning. Uh, the idea, <clears throat> knowing your story is the best medicine for healing. As you heard, my last name is Chief, and there was a time in my life where I wasn't proud of that name. The name Chief reminded me that I was indigenous. It reminded me that I was growing up poor in a bachelor pad in the north end of Winnipeg, being raised by a single father. The last name Chief reminded me of so much of the lived experience that Indigenous people have with the struggles with alcohol and alcoholism. In fact, my father passed away from, from alcoholism when I was 18. I remember as a young boy, six or seven years old, someone would come up to me and they'd say, your name's Chief? I'd say, yeah. They'd say, are you native? Are you an Indian? I never wanted to say yes to that because I thought if I said yes, maybe that meant I didn't belong. Now, you should know that <clears throat> every time I tried to tell them I was Polish or Ukrainian, I don't think they believe me. But my name, Chief, was one of the things that often associated with some of the pain and shame I felt growing up. But fortunately for me, I could shoot a basketball better than most people. And so I got a sense of belonging on the basketball court. And then because I got my sense of belonging on the basketball court, I always knew that I belonged in school. And I got a sense of generosity because every time my school's name was stamped on my jersey, I knew I was contributing and being able to give back. And to this day, I'm very grateful to the University of Winnipeg because they removed one of the biggest barriers I had in my life by giving me an athletic scholarship. And I was a student athlete at the University of Winnipeg for five years. I was the first in my family to graduate high school and then, of course, go on to university. But many of the lessons that I learned as a student athlete actually weren't on the basketball court. In fact, in my fifth year, something very special happened. I happened to be playing on one of the most culturally diverse basketball teams the country had ever seen. There was myself, who was indigenous, there was Suk Singh, and because of his faith, he had a turban. We had, a, we had Mate Marathi, who came from Bosnia. His family was in danger of the war, and our community literally saved his life. We had a guy on our team, he was a big seven-foot-one Dutch guy. He had size 19 feet, and he was, uh, wasn't a Canadian citizen. And we had Shuren Vassallo, who was Filipino, and he was five-foot-four. And Mark Carrera came from Brazil. We had guys on this team that their faith meant so much to who they were, it's how they identified. They would say that they're Mennonite or that they were Christian. And diversity isn't automatically positive. You have to invest in it. And if we want to make sure that diversity is always a point of strength, then the best way to do that is to build belonging for one another. So we did that this team on the basketball court, in the team room, and in our classroom. But what was unique, though, is the majority of the lessons I learned were often traveling, spending nights talking to each other in our hotel rooms. I remember talking to Suk Singh and asking him about the Sikh faith. And he was telling me stories about the Gudora and about the, the stories from his family. And Matt Timurati sharing with me what it's like to come from a war-torn country the tragedy and the fear. And then Sharon Vassallo often sharing with me the, the beauty and generosity of, of the Filipino community. The hardest thing for me, though, was when my teammates were asking me questions about who I was and where I was from and my spirituality. I didn't have any answers. I really didn't know. I couldn't contribute to the conversations the same way my teammates were. They were helping me build understanding and those lessons stay with me today. The hardest questions I'd often get is because the University of Winnipeg isn't in the inner city. It's a downtown campus. And so right outside the doors, they could see the over-representation of indigenous people experiencing homelessness or struggling with addictions. 
And he'd ask me those questions. I didn't know how to, to answer them. And so I wanted to start to learn about who I was and where I'm from and whom I'm from with a name like Chief. And then I started to realize that if I was going to go down that journey, I was going to have to confront some of the pain and shame that I felt growing up. And if you start to learn your story and your name and where you're from, you'll start to realize very quickly that some of the insecurities and some of the struggles you have in your own life, and it makes it quite difficult to be able to do. Now, I often share with people that something really changed for me. When a group of survivors decided to come forward and share their stories as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they taught us all, they taught us all about who we are as Canadians. And in doing so, they taught me a little bit more about who I am because many of those stories were similar to the story of my own father. Now, the best job I'm ever going to have is I got to represent the north end of Winnipeg, a neighborhood that I was born and raised in. I got to represent that, that neighborhood in the Manitoba legislature. And so one of the things that we know in any democracy is that it's a basic human right to vote. So one morning on the eve of the last federal election, I saw this story on the front page of the Winnipeg Free Press, and my eyes swelled up with some tears. And my wife said to me, what's wrong? And I said that my uncle is on the front page of the Free Press. This is a story about how impossible it is for people experiencing homelessness to vote. Because you need to have proper ID. You need to have a fixed address. You need to have people who actually care to go and engage and at least tell people where to vote. But the very first line in this story, it says, Dennis Chief is a 60 scoop survivor. And I'm so grateful that Eva Wozni, the reporter, knew what the 60 scoop was enough to put it in this story. You see, my uncle with his younger brothers and sisters were taken, were stolen when they were children, five, six, seven years old, uh, sent to the United States, sold to the United States. Our country said to young indigenous people, children, that they didn't even belong in this country. And with no, no sense of belonging, no love and care from our family, he found himself in the youth criminal justice system. And that's a pipeline to prison. And that's a pipeline to social assistance. And many people who are on social assistance often find themselves experiencing homelessness. Now, I want to be clear about one thing. You, can't, you, you cannot overcome the trauma when you're five or six or seven years old that my uncle went through. It, it's impossible. And that's what happened to my uncle. But that's not who he is. I met him when I was in my early teens. And even though his mom and dad never raised him, he called them mom and dad to the day he died. And if you read the, sto the story, he highlights in the story his quotes, Dennis, should people vote? Yes. Because you see all my friends and family living in the street. If you don't hold people accountable, they'll institutionalize everybody. And institutionalized to me means jail. Now, why did he use that term, institutionalized? It's because it's exactly what our country had done to him as a young boy at five years old, giving him no choice, our family no choice. And the quotes are grounded in kindness. And when he sees me to this day, he gives me a hug and he tells me he loves me. He's respectful. He's kind, and he's loving. But I know that's not what people see when they look at him. But you see, there's a truth that I had to admit when I was on a journey to learn about my name and where I'm from. There, wasn't a, there was a time in my life that wasn't that long ago that if someone came up to me and he said, Kevin, you see that man living in the street? That's your uncle. I might have been embarrassed. 
And it really bothers me to have to admit that to you. And I have three young boys, Daxton, Kellen, and Hayden. Kindergarten, grade two, and grade six. And if I had to take my boys and say, you see that man living in the street? That's your uncle. I might have felt a sense of shame. But you see, I went on this journey and I had to confront the very things that I used to associate with shame and embarrassment. I went and learned about the sacrifices and the suffering and struggle my own family had, like my uncle, like my dad. And now when I see my uncle and I look at this image, I'm not embarrassed, I'm not ashamed. In fact, when I look at him, I'm so proud. I'm so, so proud of him. But I know when people look at him, I know the judgment that they pass. And if you want to be the kind of interrupter that stands in solidarity with people like my uncle to strengthen his voice because you believe that passing judgment on somebody when you don't know the journey they've walked, nothing good comes from that. If you want to be the kind of interrupter that sees a system that's in place that's supposed to be doing good things to help people but that is causing harm, like our child welfare system, if you want to be the kind of interrupter that wants to be an ambassador for social change, that you believe that, there's, that there's, we need more respect and kindness and compassion in our world. If that's the kind of interrupter you want to be, I would tell you that it starts with knowing your own story, knowing who you are and where you come from, knowing the story of your name. Because when you look back and you look at your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and your own ancestors, you're going to see suffering. You're going to see struggle, just like I did. But within the struggle and the hardships that you see within your own family of people you don't even know, you're going to realize something. That all of the opportunities that you have today comes off the sacrifices that they lived. So you stand on their shoulders. And if it wasn't for them, then you wouldn't be where you are today. And in those stories of struggle and sacrifice, you see resiliency. And what ends up happening as you go down and confront some of your own insecurities and pain, what you will find that emerges from that is you're grateful. And people who are grateful, they're humble. And people who live a life of humility are always the people who serve others. So you can take any religious teaching, any spiritual teaching, including my own, the Anishinaabe teachings that are part of the Circle of Courage. And what there's a universal truth that says that a life of serving others is a life well lived. And as you start to learn about the, your own story, and you get on this journey of healing like it's been for me, you can't help at times but feel somewhat vulnerable. But vulnerability dis defined is defined by another word, which is courage. And when you speak from your own story, you can't help but be sincere. Sincerity leads to understanding, and understanding will always lead to cooperation. So racism or sexism or alcoholism, we can overcome it as long as that we have a willingness to work together. Something else happens as you explore and you seek advice from your parents and your family and your own relatives about trying to learn who you are. You will make people in your family so proud that you're interested in this. Now this is important. My dad passed away, as I said, when I was 18. He'd be 93 today. Uh, he'd be 93 this year. And one of the last things that I remember my father telling me was, my boy, be proud of who you are. 
be proud of where you're from. And I wish I could tell them that I am proud, that I'm proud of our name, Chief. And I'm proud to share that name with his grandchildren he never met. And if my dad and my uncle Dennis could see us right now, your willingness to listen to his son or nephew share a little bit about our story would make them feel so proud. So I say to you, go on your journey of learning about who you are and where you come from. Because in life, when you're struggling the most, you'll remember those stories and those sacrifices, and you'll make people feel so proud. Thank you, everyone. Kachimigwich.